Amen. John chapters 13 through 16 is in the context of what? What feast? Passover. The feast of the Passover. Who is with Jesus that he is speaking to? The twelve. That's very important to understand. Sometimes in movies or TV shows about the life of Christ, you'll have many more than just the twelve, and sometimes you'll have a a woman there in the Passover celebration that's supposed to be depicted in these chapters. But that's not accurate. That's not according to the Word of God. And therefore, we have to stick with what the Scripture says and despite what Hollywood might put forth, uh, we need to know that this is dealing with the twelve. This is where Jesus would institute the Lord's Supper. But here he is depicting uh, and talking to uh, them and showing them an example of what true love is. That sacrificial, humble love that we are to have for one another in which we're willing to serve one another. And he's going to talk further in chapter 13 about that love and how important that love is uh, as the disciples and how that we are to have that love. And you see that love contrasts with Judas and how that he did not have that love for Christ. He had a love for material things, for greed, and therefore he was willing to betray Jesus. And so he is identified as the one who would uh, betray him. The question came about because Jesus said in verse uh, 20, Most assuredly I say to you, he who receives, whomever I send, uh, uh, receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. He's talking about the authority the apostles had. In verse 21 he says, uh, Most assuredly I say to you, one of you will betray me. So the, he's depicting uh, or telling them about the betrayal that's about to take place. In verse 22, they were perplexed among themselves because they couldn't fathom or understand how one of their fellow apostles could betray Jesus. They could not understand that. They could not fathom how that would happen because the twelve experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. They had the miraculous abilities to go out and do these things. That included Judas. He cast out demons with the rest of them. He healed the sick with the rest of them. He preached by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit like the rest of them. However, having those miraculous abilities, having that power just like Peter and the rest of the apostles had, did not take away Judas and his freedom of choice. He was still a free moral agent. And therefore, he could choose to betray Jesus. And in fact, that's exactly what he did. Of course, they ask among uh, themselves, and they want John to ask, because he's the closest to Jesus. And it says, in verse 26, Jesus answered and said, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. Having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Now we talked about a Sunday morning, the concept of Satan entering into Judas. And how that this was what Judas allowed to happen. And how that he did not resist the devil, like the Bible tells us to do, that the devil will flee from us. He gave in to the devil to to, uh, betray Jesus. So what you have here is him giving in to uh, Satan. Satan entered him. It's very interesting that not too long before this, he had the Holy Spirit. He had the power of God. Now, just to prove and verify that fact... I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. 
This is the choosing of the twelve apostles from among the disciples. Jesus chose them to be apostles. Verse 1, Matthew 10 and verse 1, And when they had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all kinds of sick and all kinds of disease. Now the twelve he gave the power to. Look at verse 2. Now the names of the twelve of the apostles are these, Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James the son of Alphaeus, and Libius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Now Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him, was part of the ones that you find in verse 1 who had the power to cast out unclean spirits, to heal all manner of sick and all manner of diseases. He is the one, he's one of the uh, twelve that would have the power of verse 19. Look at Matthew 10 and verse 19. When, When they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. That was Judas too. That was Judas too. So at this time, Judas was doing good. Now, Judas is doing bad. Judas fell away. He became unfaithful. And therefore, by his own choice, when we looked at those passages in Acts chapter 1, it is by transgression that Judas fell. And uh, the choices he made led to tremendous regret, which also led to him committing suicide and not handling his sin properly. It's just a very sad and tragic account of a man who was with Christ personally on earth, partook of that power that the rest of the apostles had, and yet walked away from it. Was willing to uh, betray Jesus. So that's a lesson for all of us. If Jesus is closest his 12 as Johnny Ramsey used to say he had 12 students and one of them flunked the course if that can happen to Judas that can happen to us that's why we need to be very careful and take heed lest we fall verse 27 what you do do quickly verse 28 and now one at the table knew Uh, But no one, excuse me, at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus said to him, buy those things we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. Having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately, and it was night. So they didn't understand what... Jesus had said to Judas and they interpreted that to, well, maybe he's going to go out and he's going to uh, buy something for our feast, talking about the feast of Passover, or to give something for the poor because he had the money box. But what did he used to do in the money box? He used to steal from it. He used to steal from that money box. John chapter 12 tells us that. Chapter 12 and verse 6. So we see a, a, a spiraling downward of Judas in, in the gospel accounts. Falling away usually does not take place all at once overnight. Usually it accumulates over time. People become unfaithful little by little, increment by increment, and then they completely fall away. That's why it says in the, in the book of Hebrews, we should give the more earnest heed lest we drift. We drift. Drifting is a slow process. So we need to be on guard. It's very interesting. In verse 30 it says, Having received the piece of bread, he went out immediately, and it was night. That's a, a true statement that it was dark outside, but also it's the time of darkness. It was spiritually night. It was spiritually dark what was about to happen. And so 
uh, not only was it literally night, but it was night. The, the forces of darkness were about to go against Christ. And so that is there uh, to indicate that as well. Then in verses 31 through 35, he's going to emphasize a new commandment. A new commandment. So we see uh, that he's going to give this new commandment about love. And the reason why he's going to give it, he's letting them know, I'm not going to be with you much longer. And they're going to have to learn how to get along with one another. They're going to have to learn how to deal with the problems that disciples have among themselves. So then he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am, you cannot come, as now I say to you. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So he's letting them know that the time the Son of Man, that is the expression Jesus used more often than any other uh, expression to describe himself, the Son of Man emphasizing his humanity, is going to be glorified, and God is going to be glorified in him. What is going to take place is a tragic thing, but on the same, at the same time it's going to be something glorious. Because that terrible tragedy of Jesus going to the cross and suffering is going to bring about a glory. It's going to result in glory. So this is why he came into the world to be sacrificed. And so this is going to bring glory to God. And he says there in verse 32, If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Remember, now his hour had come, chapter 13 and verse 1. His hour had come for him to be uh, glorified and to depart uh, from this world, chapter 13 and verse 1 says. And remember, in the first part of chapter 13, he loved his own, loved them to the end, and he proved his love to them in an example of doing what? What did he do? He washed the apostles' feet. And he says, I've given you an example that you ought to wash one another's feet. Verse 14. And so he says there in verse 33, Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer, and you will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I am you cannot come, as now I say to you. In other words, I'm going to go away. I'm not going to be with you personally on earth anymore. And Oftentimes, when there were problems or questions or, 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 or uh, difficulty among the disciples, they could go to Jesus. He would be there. But he's not going to be there anymore. And where, where he's going, they cannot come. Well, of course, he's going to the cross. He's going to go back to heaven after his ascension. And at that time, they cannot be there with him. So he says, I give you a new commandment, verse 34, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Now, the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself is in the Old Testament. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 8 speaks of that. We're to love our neighbor as ourself. So does Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5. And it's part of the two greatest commandments that Jesus spoke of. In Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 33, you're to love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And you're to love your neighbor as yourself. So the concept of loving one another and loving your neighbor as yourself is from the Old Testament. That's been God's will ever since Moses revealed it in the Old Testament. 
But here's something different about it. This is why this is new. Verse 34. As I have loved you. For the first time, humanity had a perfect example of love in Jesus Christ. A perfect example. Before that, there, there never was one. There never was one. Even Moses, as great a man as he was, he was a flawed individual. Abraham was a flawed individual. All the great men, David, flawed individual. So there was never a perfect example of how to love one another until Jesus. So that's why he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. That you also love one another. So you follow this example, and he says that what he did is going to be an example to them there in John chapter 13. He says, uh, verse 15, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. Most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who is sent, he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So here is the love that you're to have one another, this active love the disciples are to have. And notice what he says in verse 35. This is how the people of the world are going to know that you're my disciples. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Love for one another. And so this is the kind of uh, uh, example to the world that's going to show forth that we are true followers of Christ. In John chapter 17, he's going to say, if you have unity among yourself, that's how the world will know that you are my disciples and that, that uh, I have been sent into the world. John 17, uh, verse, beginning in verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. So this love is what binds us together in unity. And that unity and that love shows the world that we're serious about following Jesus and about loving one another. Let's look at Ephesians 4. The seven ones of unity. Before he talks about the seven ones of unity, one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father, he says there has to be an attitude and a disposition of our hearts to maintain this unity. Chapter 4 and verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. With all lowliness and gentleness and long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Then he goes into talking about the seven ones of unity. That means that we have to have an attitude of lowliness with one another, long suffering with one another, a bearing with one another. You can go through and study all of those passages that deal with the one another concept. And when we do that, you have unity and you have that love within a congregation. I mean, the opposite of that attitude or opposite of this disposition and mindset is, well, if I don't get my way, I'm going to cause trouble. I'm going to stir up trouble. Or if I'm upset about something, among the disciples, I'm just going to go someplace else. I'm going to go somewhere else. Does that foster, does that promote unity among disciples in a church? Does it? No. We're to have a, a forbearance and a love towards one another, a tolerance towards one another, 
and love one another and, and, uh, and, and have this attitude of wanting to help one another. And if the, the attitude is, well, I'm going someplace else and just walk away from your spiritual family. How does that promote unity? That promotes division. John talks about that new commandment as well. 1 John chapter 2, verse 7. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, 1 John 2 and verse 7, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him. It's true in him and in you. Talking about Christ. Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says that he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. You see, really the the opposite of love is hate. That's what the Bible says, polar opposite. And so we, we are to have this love for one another, and, and that promotes unity among the disciples. Look at 2 John, beginning in verse 5. 2 John, beginning in verse 5. And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which you have had from the beginning, that you love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to His commandments. This is the commandment, that as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. So we have to have that love for one another, and that uh, forgiving spirit toward one another. And when we have that, that definitely uh, promotes unity among God's people. It's the attitude that you find, again, in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Paul talks about this. Verse 4. As you have many members in one body, but not all the members have the same function. So we are uh, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Verse 9. Romans 12 and verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. In other words, let it be genuine. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is hot, uh, what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, uh, serving the Lord. And we're to bless those who uh, persecute us, verse 14, bless and not curse. Verse 16, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. So, I mean, all throughout the scripture, uh, this concept of this new commandment is emphasized. And that is what will promote unity among the disciples within a congregation. Now, sometimes there are conflict resolutions that need to happen. Jesus talked about that. Look at Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, verse 3 and 4. Take heed to yourself. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. So the conflict resolution is there uh, in which we are to deal with whatever problems that may arise uh, among brethren. And so if we are motivated by love for one another, the solution is not to leave and go someplace else. The solution is to work out those problems. And so we, in doing so, create an atmosphere of unity in which we are striving to do what's right. Any questions or comments about that?
It's very interesting that ancient writers uh, that wrote about Christianity in the early centuries said, see how the disciples love one another. Those who were outside the church would look at the church of the first century and it showed their love and and their, their concern about one another. And so it made an impression upon those uh, people that were outside the church. That they had that love for uh, one another. Now, Peter's love is going to be tested. Verses uh, 36 through 38, back to John chapter 14. His his love is going to be um, tested, his loyalty... But he's, he's going to boast some great things here, but then be brought back down to reality. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. You can be with me eventually, but you can't follow me now. Peter said to him, Lord... Why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. Jesus answered him, Will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly I say to you, The rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. You see, Peter here is exhibiting, because it's, a, a, it's the way he is. We've talked about this. He's very impulsive which he, he's willing to speak up and say some things. And, and here's one of these impulsive moments where Peter is boasting, I will lay down my life for you. And we know that when, he was, uh, when Jesus was arrested, who was it that drew his sword? It was Peter. He cut off the servant Malchus's ear, trying to defend Christ. And, and Jesus said, put away your sword. I could call legions of angels to deliver me. And so Peter had a zeal, but it was misplaced. He did not understand where Jesus was going. Where are you going? The concept of Jesus dying on the cross for Peter being a Jew from what he was raised with and what he had been taught was inconceivable. Why would Jesus have a Messiah, or excuse me, why would God have a Messiah, a son, that would be defeated and be executed on a cross. That didn't make sense to him. Again, because of a misunderstanding of the Old Testament. And so he says, Lord, there in verse 37, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. He's not understanding what's about to happen. And he said, I'm willing to lay down my life. But then we see that later on, when he's warming himself by the fire, that courage is gone. And he denies. He denies Jesus three times. Just as Jesus prophesied of here. And sometimes we can be like that when it comes to uh, our Christianity and living the Christian life that we are, when we're around our brothers and sisters, we can boast great things, so to speak. And we can um, talk about how loyal to, to Christ we are. We can sing about it in our songs. But the real testing is when you're warming yourself by the fire out in the world. That's the real test to whether you're going to be loyal to Christ. It's easy for us to to, to sing about it and to preach about it and to teach about it. But the, 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 when the testing comes, we oftentimes find ourselves like Peter and, and we, we can deny Christ even though that's not really the intent of what we have sung about or spoke about when we were with our disciples or with the disciples. So the, Peter is, is, is there and he can't even conceive about What's going to happen? He's willing to fight for Jesus. He's willing to physically go to to battle for Jesus and lay down his life. But when push push came to shove, uh, when he was questioned, oh, I don't don't know him. I don't know that man. I don't know him. 
that bravery is gone so we have to realize that uh, that Peter is uh, you know I identify probably more with Peter than anyone else up and down up and down having those difficulties Peter was a very um, good example of some of the struggles and the difficulties that we have hard in the right place but sometimes the the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak as Jesus will say to them as they're in the garden with him therefore uh, we can find ourselves denying Christ even though uh, that is not what we intended to do what happened after he denied Christ Jesus looked at him and then what did Peter do he went out and he wept bitterly he denied Christ uh, yes right before the morning breaks right yeah it's 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 leading up chapter 13 14 15 and 16 all and it's 17 the prayer there is all in one night leading up to his arrest in chapter 18 yes Yes, I think it might be in John's account. Is, and I might be wrong about that. John 18. Um, verse 10. He cut off his ear. Servant's name was Malchus. Luke 22.51. Okay, Luke tells us the ear was healed. Luke 22. Mm -hmm. and in verse 51 uh, verse 50 and 51 Luke chapter 22 one of them struck uh, struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear we learn that that was Peter and we learn that that was Malchus in the other account from John and in verse 51 Luke chapter 22 Peter answered and said permit even this and he touched his ear and healed him. So there's the healing of that. Then in verse 61. Uh, well let's look at where, where he betrayed him in, in Luke chapter 22. Um, verse 54. Luke 22 and verse 54. This is the actual betrayal of Jesus or denying of Jesus, Peter does. Having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house, but Peter followed at a distance. Now he's following at a distance. Now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down, Peter sat among them, and a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was also with him. Here's a servant girl saying, This man was also with him. But he denied, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And after a little while, another saw him and said, You also are of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying immediately. When he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Can you imagine him looking at you? After you had made the boast just a few hours earlier, I'll never deny you. I'll, I'll lay down my life. And he looks right at him. And it, it, it struck him to his core. And he went out and he wept bitterly. But he was restored. Peter repented. God's grace forgave him. You know, I am convinced of this, that if Judas would have repented, God would have forgiven him. But God knew he wouldn't repent. And that's why Judas wound up committing suicide and dying in, 
in disgrace. But, you know, Peter denied him just as much as Judas did. But Peter dealt with his sin correctly. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, that's the sad reality of things. Exactly. He had a choice. Had a choice in the matter. And so we see uh, the, the, the fulfillment of this and how that, uh, the man, uh, Peter, was a flaw, very flawed individual, but God could still use him. Used him on the day of Pentecost to preach that sermon. He wasn't the only one preaching, but he also used Peter to introduce the gospel to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. And then Peter wrote 1st and 2nd Peter. And so, no matter what mistakes we make, if we repent and come back to the Lord, He can still use us to do great things. Yes? I think there is a, I'm not sure where the verse is, but where Jesus said, all of you will betray me. Tonight, all of you will betray me. So, uh, definitely, they all, in a sense, you know, like the prophecy said, the, the, the shepherd will be struck and the sheep will scatter. And that's exactly what the disciples did. They, they, they scattered. So that brings us to chapter 14. In just a few verses we're going to look at, and the time is going to be up. Uh, He is going to encourage them. Their hearts are troubled. And he says in verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled, John 14 and verse 1. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So he's trying to comfort them. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And we've seen the connection between believing in God and believing in his Son all throughout the book of John. And Jesus said, if you deny me, you're denying the Father too. But if you believe in me and believe in my teachings and you follow me, you're following God. So that's what he's emphasizing here in John 14 and verse 1. And he lets them know that there's something uh, beyond this life to look forward to. In my Father's house are many uh, dwelling places. Now, the... The King James and the New King James use the word mansions. And I know that we sing this song, I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. And we sing songs about those bright mansions over there. And it's based upon uh, the King James language uh, of heaven. And sometimes the, the, even preachers will preach about each, each person is going to get their own mansion in heaven. We're gonna have, you're going to have a mansion, I'm going to have a mansion... But that's really not an accurate understanding of the language here. That's why in other translations, it says dwelling places or rooms. In my Father's house are many rooms. There's one house with many rooms in it. There's one heaven, and there's plenty of space for everyone. That's what he's saying. And so the, a, lot of, a lot of the songs that we sing and such, I'm not saying that they're unscriptural. I'm just saying if you understand it within a proper context of what the Bible says, this is talking about being with God for all eternity. That perfect fellowship that we will have, there's one house with many rooms, many dwelling places. And he was going to prepare a place for them. And, of course, he wanted them to know that this is something that you have to look forward to. Your heart is troubled now. These are things that you don't understand now. But there's something beyond to look forward to. 
and I go to prepare a place for you. Now, what he did was he went to the cross. He went to the cross to prepare a place for them in heaven. And it's not just limited to the apostles. It's for everyone. This promise of heaven is for everyone. The apostle Paul told us that. Look at 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 8. We'll close on this. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 8. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but to all who have loved His appearing. So the promise of being with God in heaven for all eternity and having that crown of righteousness John calls it, or Jesus through John, calls it a crown of life in Revelation 2 and verse 10. It's not just for the apostles. It's for everyone. It's for all who have loved His appearing. All those who love Christ and do His will are going to receive that crown of righteousness. So going back to John chapter 14 and ending on this note, we see that the promise here of the Father's house with plenty of rooms in it, in it is not limited to the apostles because of what we've seen in, in that passage there in Second Timothy 4 and other passages we could look at as well. Revelation 21 and 22, those chapters. This is a promise for those who are faithful. And it's been said before so many times, and it is so true, heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. The unprepared will not be in heaven. It is a prepared place for a prepared people. And that's why it's important that we abide in God's will, obey that gospel, and live faithful to Him. Okay, Sunday morning, Lord willing, we will continue our study uh, in John chapter 14.